Welcome back everyone to week 15. Now, if you have looked at your schedule, you will have realized that I got week 14 and 15 kind of mixed up a little, but we're just going to roll with it. And we are going to be looking at sacred architecture today. And moreover, you'll probably also notice that week 15 is the last of your reading. So congratulations, we are done. Next week, I'm actually going to have you do a fun exercise to do with architecture and you know, some creativity on your part. So it'll be an interesting week. Now, when it comes to sacred architecture, I realized that there was one region of the world that we hadn't spent uh, much time in, and that was Asia. And so I'm going to be focusing on Buddhist architecture and how it develops around the world. Now, uh, for the most part, I'm going to have you watching these uh, short video clips that are going to delve in deeper into how these develop. But I want to give you kind of the framework in this video. So when we talk about Buddhism, it is going to develop in the 6th century in this region right here, which is in northern India and into um, Central Asia. And it is going to very quickly spread. It spreads into India. However, it doesn't stay in India very long. And we're going to see how instead it is going to transfer over into all of the trade networks that India had during this time. So it's going to go down into Southeast Asia, into uh, the Pacific Islands, into China, and into Japan. And as it travels, it's going to change because Buddhism in its original form, it's not necessarily a religion. You really couldn't call it a religion uh, in its original form. Today, it is a religion. And as it moves across Asia, it is going to become a religion, especially uh, Mahayana Buddhism, which is what uh, the main form of Buddhism in East Asia. And these types of Buddhism are going to deify the Buddha. So um, the Buddha himself is going to become almost godlike. You're going to have bodhisattvas who are going to help people reach enlightenment. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. But in its original form, Buddhism is more a philosophy of how to live your life. So who was the Buddha? What was his path? And what did he teach? Well, this could take us an entire semester to cover. So I'm just going to quickly, very kind of superficially explain so you have an idea of what the buildings are we're looking at and what the philosophy behind them is. So the Buddha began as a prince. So he was a man. He was a prince in the north of India. And he lived a very lavish lifestyle as a prince. He never went outside. He never saw poverty or pain or suffering or anything like that. He married, he had a child. And then one day uh, he he sees an old person suffering. He he leaves his palace. So he goes over the gates and he sees all of the suffering of the people outside. And he realizes, you know, I've been living an illusion. And the, so he goes on a journey to figure out what is the solution to suffering. What? How can you get rid of pain and suffering and all of those ailments that humanity deals with? And so he tries a couple different methods. So he tries not eating at all and just kind of starving his body uh, to see if he can figure this out. And then he just realizes that he's really hungry and he's starving and it's not helping at all. And then he goes to meditate under a Bodhi tree. So it's a particular type of tree. And he realizes he reaches enlightenment. So he meditates and he reaches this higher level of being in which he realizes that among many things, uh, so he has an entire list of things, ways that you should live your life. But the gist of it is live your life in moderation, right? Uh, now, the story gets embellished and it gets uh, changed over time. And then there are kind of more um, 
magical elements that get pulled into the story of the Buddha. But Buddha just means enlightenment, enlightened one. And again, he is teaching this metal path. So don't ever go over in one way or the other. Like don't become an ascetic, meaning don't starve yourself of food and pleasure and all of that stuff, but also don't be gluttonous. Just kind of stay on this middle path. Now, because when he died, he did not want to become a god. He saw himself as a man and he practiced his way of life and he taught it to his disciples. But he did not want to be deified. And so in the very early stages of Buddhism, after he dies, we only see anaconic images of the Buddha. And this means an image that is not the Buddha stands for him. And some of the most famous ones are a Bodhi tree, the wheel, which is right here, and the lotus blossom. So in the architecture, I'm going to show you in a second you are going to see all sorts of different images carved into the stone. And many of them represent the Buddha, even though he doesn't show up on images. And you probably saw this slide and you're like, there's an image of the Buddha. Well, yes, later on, he's going to be represented and he's gonna be, his appearance is gonna to change to adapt to the different regions of Asia and of, Western Asia where Buddhism spreads. This is a very um, Western Asian Buddha. So he, he looks almost Greek, uh, which is happened in the region of Gandhara. But as you reach into China and Japan, he is going to become much more Chinese and Japanese in appearance and in style in terms of technique. So we're going to look at architecture, though. So let's look at the Great Stupa at Sanchi. So in terms of sacred architecture, this is a stupa. So while we looked at cathedrals and religious buildings of the, middle, the European Middle Ages, this is a sacred building for early Buddhists. And what we see here is a mound. So this is a solid mound. And inside is believed very much like the relics to hold the remains of the Buddha. So after the Buddha died, he was buried. And then later on, there was a king who adopted Buddhism. His name was Ashoka. And what he did was he interred the remains of the Buddha and he spread them out across all of these stupas. And this is one of them. And so this is solid. You don't go inside of it. What you do instead is you circumambulate, meaning you walk around it. So let's delve a little bit deeper. There are a lot of sacred significance to the different regions of the stupa. Now, one of the main ones is going to be the entrance here. And the importance of these toranas and of the gates here is to separate sacred space from the profane or the the regular world right once you step inside you are in sacred space and this is very similar to the doors in a cathedral or the gates to a temple right and let's see. here you have kind of that side view and you can see how you would go into the sacred space and then you would walk around it so that's what we call circumambulation which is a mouthful. Now, what is fascinating about these stupas are the decorations, the carvings on these toranas and on different parts of the gates themselves. The stupa itself was very plain when it was first built by Ashoka, but later on it was embellished. And so here we have some beautiful imagery of elephants, but at the very center, you have the stupa itself. And the stupa is another image for the Buddha. So when we're looking at this image, we know that the Buddha is being represented here through the stupa. Here, he's being represented by the Bodhi tree. And all of these carvings tell stories of this kind of more magical life of the Buddha. 
And this is very similar to what we find in a Catholic cathedral where it would tell the story of Christ. And some of the most interesting sculptures here are ones that mix traditional Hindu imagery. You can see this figure right here, which is in this very typical, curvaceous, kind of very soft and um, uh, often sexually uh, explicit imagery of Hinduism. And that is going to be tied into Buddhist imagery. Now, I told you later on they would add more things to these stupas. So if you were to go there today, you would see actual sculptures of the Buddha. But you can see here how it's been added to the original structure. And that's one of the things to keep in mind when we look at sacred architecture. It is not a static thing, very similar to what I showed you at the beginning of architecture with the Jenna mosque, the one that they had to keep replastering. The sacred spaces are updated, they're changed, they're beautified by each generation, and so they change, they're ever-changing. And that's what's really fascinating about them, but also really hard to pinpoint like what style this is in, or even what's original. And at the site in Sanchi, you don't just have the great stupa at Sanchi, this is a different stupa. But you can see they all have these beautifully carved toranas. And this is the site itself. You can see this is the great stupa right in the center. And then you have other smaller stupas. Now the stupa is going to change because what's really interesting about Buddhism is it really adapts to the local culture. And often it mixes in with local indigenous religions, such as in Japan, where people were Buddhist, but they also practiced Shintoism, and there was not necessarily a conflict between these. So what we get in Southeast Asia are stupas that start to become a little bit taller, right? So they start looking a little bit more bell-like. In China, uh, you get you do get wooden stupas, which are now going to be called pagodas. So in East Asia, they're called pagodas. Uh, but the, one of the first pagodas in China is the Wild Goose Pagoda, and it's actually made out of stone. And then in Japan, you can see how they're getting even taller. You have the typical wooden Japanese pagoda. Again, talking about what materials you use. Traditional Japanese architecture has always used wood. And so when they go to build their own version of a stupa, they are going to include a lot of the architectural details that they had already been using, including the use of wood. So if we want to talk about Southeast Asia, we have to talk about Angkor Wat. Now, Angkor Wat was originally a Buddhist site, which later became a Hindu site. Again, ever-changing in terms of sacred spaces. But here we see some of those early details of those stupas. Now, again, the space has been changed quite a bit. But you can see some of, uh, some of that influence there. In terms of China, we have, like I said, the Wild Goose Pagoda. So again, taller. And now you can actually go inside the structure. And that is very different than the stupa itself. And by the way, buildings don't just serve one function. The other function of these very tall pagodas in East Asia is if you go all the way to the top, it also makes for a great lookout tower. And then we have Japan. So this is in Nara, and this is a five level pagoda. And you can see kind of all of the levels here. And the type of architecture that we're looking at here. And in China and Japan, we're gonna see wood architecture and wood bracketing, meaning these structures don't have any nails to hold them together. Instead, they use wooden brackets to hold the structures together. Now, they're beautiful and 
Japan is always used to wood. It's a very sympathetic material, meaning it's very earthy. Uh, it bends, so if there's earthquakes, it, it, it's really good to be in a wooden structure. Unfortunately, it also very easily catches on fire. And so we don't have any very ancient, very, very ancient pagodas left because generally they catch on fire and then they just get reconstructed. And this actually happened with very early cathedrals as well in Western Europe. Oh, and that is the last of my slides. So I'm gonna have you actually watch more in-depth videos. Um, I didn't even mention Barabadur, which is I think one of the videos I'm gonna have you watch. So again, I just wanted to give you a little bit of context of how Buddhist architecture really flows in and develops throughout East Asia. And then you'll get a chance to take a closer look through those documentary videos. And I will see all of you next week with a very fun assignment.